Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dave Mercer, and I will be the moderator for our presentation. I'm a member of Floor's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, that is our people, are at the core of our success. Today's webinar is titled Bridging the Gap, Human Factors and AI in Industrial Automation. The presentation today traces the history of human factors engineering in optimizing industrial processes, from the origins of early assembly lines through to optimizing for today's AI-enabled control systems in heavily automated facilities. Now, to set the stage for today's webinar with the HSE topic, please join me in welcoming Erica Sebastian. And joining Erica is Alex Perkle. So, Alex, I'll now hand it over to you. Thank you, Dave, and good day, everyone. Before Joe describes how human factors can be integrated with artificial intelligence and industrial automation, we first will discuss the HSE topic of the ethics and cybersecurity of AI and automation. Ethics is one of, if not the biggest concern related to AI and automation as their effectiveness across industries increases. Potential implications of these technologies include displacing humans in the workforce, increasing capabilities for hacking and deep fakes, improved efficiency for data breaches and data mining, and more efficient advanced phishing techniques. These ethical concerns raise several important questions to consider. How do we eliminate AI bias? How can we guard against mistakes and artificial stupidity or hallucinations? How do machines affect human behavior and interaction? And how do we use and distribute the wealth created by machines to combat inequality? As systems become more integrated and open, extending beyond themselves and incorporating with outside networks, it becomes possible for people to hack into systems that traditionally were not hackable. It also becomes possible for AI-enabled autonomous agents to hack with or without guidance or control from humans. As seen in the articles and papers referenced in the following slide, there are other ethical concerns that are relevant to consider as well. Are algorithms biased intentionally or unintentionally? Is data sampling biased intentionally or unintentionally? Does AI displace workers, and if so, in which industries and to what degree? Is AI used for surveillance, and in this role, can it, be, can it make mistakes that have severe consequences for people? Are we able to assess the correctness and trustworthiness of AI, or is the progression of technology outpacing our ability to understand how and why AI arrives at its conclusions? Can AI decide that the most efficient or safe outcome for one individual or set of individuals justifies subjecting others to suffering? With all of these concerns in mind, we must deliberately investigate and manage the ethical dimensions of implementing automated technologies, both the vulnerabilities and benefits they create in social and economic systems. Considering the potential concerns around AI and automation is essential to ensuring ethical and secure applications of these tools. When being leveraged in considerate and responsible applications, as seen in some of the examples on this slide, AI and automation can help to improve safety, optimize efficiency, and enhance human decision-making across various high-risk industries. Advancements in hardware and software alike have continued to progress at increasing rates in recent years, leading to the use of AI automa and automation in many forms and contexts. As discussed on the previous slide, the unethical use of AI and automation presents critical questions that need to be asked when defending against and implementing such powerful tools. But even in instances when AI and automation are being used in ethical manners that enhances cybersecurity efforts, there are still important questions that need to be considered. Does AI enhance human decision-making processes, or does it diminish human oversight in a detrimental fashion? Will AI reduce the need for human intervention, or does it require continuous oversight? Does AI improve operational efficiency without compromising safety standards? And is AI's use in automating predictive maintenance helping to prevent large-scale failures in critical industries or does it contribute to a disconnect between operators and the equipment they oversee? 
With combined insight derived from investigating potential threats from malicious actors and potential oversights on beneficial use cases associated with AI and automation, we can strive to utilize these powerful tools to reinforce and support the ethics and cybersecurity of the industries we are involved in. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, Alex. Jobs don't go away in an AI-enhanced world. The roles of humans shift. Humans will continue to match or exceed the capabilities of AI for tasks that entail creative problem solving and creative systems development. Humans are also essential for defining the system goals and determining measuring measures of success. This information is critical for training and guiding AI so that it can be efficient. This shift shouldn't be seen as scary or new. As the saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. Right from when humans started farming and engaging in animal husbandry, they shifted some of their workload to non-human biological agents, to animals or to plants or machines that could do something better than humans could. And then the humans manage those other agents. This is no different. AI, machine learning, and other algorithm-based autonomous and semi-autonomous agents are sets of tools, and in some cases, collaborators, that can do some things better than humans can. The question is, how do we manage our new tools and collaborators? By addressing this question, People will occupy new roles, and we have to be cognizant of these transitions and the time and logistical challenges that they entail. Even though this technology is wonderful and adds a lot of power to how we operate as individuals and organizations, basic rules like the KISS principle, keep it simple, bound complexity, minimizing degrees of freedom, and minimizing variables remain valid strategies. That is, being very selective in what is and is not present in the system, what is and is not sampled, what is and is not trained against, and what is and is not trusted. These remain core tenets of working with AI and ML in useful and efficient ways. These strategies still hold true. Lastly, what is the motivation for addressing this topic right now? Why should we talk about human factors and AI as they relate to human automation in industrial facilities? From a, from a business perspective, it's because an enormous emerging market that is growing very, very rapidly. It's of concern to our clients, partners, and the jurisdictions in which we operate. Thank you for your attention. And now I will hand it over to Joe for the main presentation. Thank you, Erica and Alex, for that HSE topic. Thank you, David, for the introductions, and welcome and thank you to the audience members for attending this presentation on Human Factors AI and Automation. As David described, today we will learn about the history of human factors and a bit about the current state of the practice, especially as it relates to AI and automation. We're addressing human factors in facilities design, especially as it relates to AI and automation, because of its potential to improve process and facility design and operations. This diagram is a modified version of the McLeamy curve. We are focusing on the inclusion of more rigorous requirements development as a way to refine and validate project scope. We'll cover why proper requirements development at the start of projects tends to also reduce risk and save time and money. Human factors looks at people, their teams, their tools, and their environments collectively as a human machine system of systems that produces work. Human factors methods are holistic, mapping systems and processes and figuring out ways to optimize them. Of course, human factors is especially focused on the role of humans in process optimizations. From this perspective, human factors goals are to improve the safety, comfort, efficiency, and effectiveness of work processes, work systems, and work environments for the people uh, participating in these work processes. By doing work, we mean that people have the ability to, one, perceive things and activities around themselves, two, think about those things and activities and plan their own actions in response to the things and activities around them, and three, affect physical or logical responses to the things and activities around themselves. Human factors and ergonomics break down work into three dimensions of concern, one, the physical dimension, two, the cognitive dimension, and three, the organizational dimension. 
Almost all activities incorporate the physical and the cognitive dimensions. And any activity that requires collaborating with others also includes an organizational dimension. By an organizational dimension, we mean that social relationships between agents are governed by rules. The origins of human factors in ergonomics can be traced back approximately 2,500 years to the ancient Greeks who developed rules of thumb for producing useful, safe, and comfortable tools and systems. The origins of modern human factors in ergonomics are generally traced back just over 100 years to Frederick Winslow Taylor, who is widely credited as doing the first work on scientific management of work processes. Taylor's work ultimately contributed to the founding of the fields of human factors and ergonomics, systems engineering, industrial engineering, industrial hygiene, and scientific consulting. Taylor addressed questions like, how do we optimize the way that people produce products on assembly lines? How do we make assembly lines safer? How do we eliminate or simplify task steps as part of optimization? How do we eliminate threats or risks or hazards? Many of the analytical processes that Taylor used are now called observational studies. In the early 20th century, the Gilbreths used a special type of observational study called a time series study to optimize the timing of steps and work processes. These methods became the foundation of what is known as task analysis. But by the post-World War II period, the nature of industrial production had evolved significantly as increasingly complex control systems were integrated to run processes. Partially automated production systems that include complex control systems were a lot more complicated for somebody to understand and to manage. Historically, if a person started out on an assembly line, that person could completely learn the production process. By the time the person became a manager, the process was still fundamentally what the person had learned 10 or 20 or 30 years before the processes were very stable. That is, the processes were completely knowable by a person. Also, a person could master a process and that knowledge would remain stable for the majority or entirety of that person's career. This is a very important point. Any one person who was of reasonable intelligence could know everything about how to do a work process and could count on that knowledge remaining stable and relevant for decades. But with the advent of automation and complex control systems overlaid on production, gradually it was no longer possible for one person to learn everything about a complicated or complex production process. And even if a person did learn everything about a complicated or complex production process, parts of that knowledge would already be irrelevant by the time the person had mastered the knowledge because the system's evolution was accelerating. By the 1960s and 70s, people had a new problem. Automated production processes had become so complicated and begun to evolve so rapidly that it would never be possible for anybody to ever become an expert in the way the system works. This is a big change for businesses. How can a business plan and manage a process that none of its staff nor its consultants fully understand? Human factors had to adapt to this new reality. If it's not possible to fully know the system of interest, we at least have to know the system of interest well enough to manage it to optimize it, to make it safe, and to reduce risk. This required the evolution of task analysis. Researchers Annette and Duncan developed hierarchical task analysis to address this need. Hierarchical task analysis maps not only what an expert does do, but also all major possibilities of what could be done in the system of interest in order to figure out what may or may not be problematic and what may or may not be optimal. The example at the right shows that if you were to borrow a book from a library with a complex automated book checkout process, there's no one set workflow anymore. The workflow is heavily dependent upon the degree of automation of the cataloging system and where one is in the system. For this reason, now we have to map the possibilities and to try to figure out what people are most likely to do in the system of interest from any given interface. After the 1970s, the incorporation of the Internet greatly expanded the depth, breadth, and openness of industrial automation systems. Starting in the 1980s, the scale, complexity, and ubiquity of control systems, as well as their rates of change, continued to increase at an ever-increasing pace, creating many new challenges. Industries had always sought to reduce risk to manage it and to optimize performance, but by the 1980s, the risks were greatly complicated by the scale, complexity, integratedness, 
real-time data sensing and processing requirements, and trust and verification requirements of our complex semi-autonomous industrial production systems. Designers and owners had new questions to ponder. Are we sampling the right information? And are the accuracy and precision of our samples sufficient? What information can we trust and what information can we not trust? To what degree are systems decentralized or centralized? To what degree are the systems modularized or integrated? The nature of the problem changed fundamentally. Human factors and systems engineering responded with a series of new methods and tools. We'll focus on some new methods that evolved from hierarchical task analysis that address how to map and optimize automated system challenges. In the last 20 to 30 years, human factors engineering accounts for all of the system's dynamics by making a whole series of maps of systems processes from different critical perspectives. When we map a system in many different ways, we're looking for alignment between the maps. Following this slide from left to right, for systems that are AI enhanced or have automation, there's a cognitive load imposed on human and non-human agents alike, including computer systems, when they engage in a work process. Within a given work domain and work organization, human and non-human agents have cognitive capabilities, strategies, and competencies for perceiving and processing information related to the work process. When more than one agent perceives and processes information collaboratively, there are social and organizational aspects to executing the work. Lastly, there are user interfaces through which people interact with other people, with AI, and with automated systems. We have to make sure that there's alignment between all of these agents, all of these systems, all of these perspectives, between all of these interfaces, because a key insight in human factors is that when things go wrong, when people or AI struggle to perceive, struggle to learn, struggle to understand, when businesses struggle to optimize, when processes fail, a lot of the time it's because these various perspectives onto the enterprise's structures and behaviors, including the work processes and automation, are not in alignment. These misalignments create internal friction. Human factors and systems engineering have developed many wonderful methods for finding these misalignments and fixing them. Over time, standard sets of maps of systems processes have been developed in human factors and systems engineering. There are standard sets of maps that have been identified as particularly useful for systems design and operations. These maps break down into ways of representing, one, the goals of the system of interest, two, the structures of the system of interest, that is, what a system is composed of, three, the behaviors of the system of interest, that is, what a system does, and four, the flows of information, energy, money, materials, waste, and people through the system of interest. By way of analogy, if we design a building, we develop plans, elevations, sections, details, scope, schedule, and budget, and then we look for alignment between all of them. This is how we know we've designed the building well, that and construction and operations will proceed according to plan. It is the same case with developing uh, tools for AI and automation. With analyzing work processes, we map the processes using different maps and then look for alignment between the maps. Given these dynamics, there are new consultants and stakeholders that are required on projects to address the tight integration of ubiquitous control systems, AI and automation. Historically, many of these services have been provided to a limited degree by equipment vendors. However, for large projects, there is a gap. This gap is the integration of the organizational workflows, the physical systems, and the software-based control systems, and now AI-enhanced systems as well. Typically, no vendor provides comprehensive integration services. This leaves the owner to work with each individual vendor to pull together a patchwork of integrations. Adding systems development consultants to the facilities development team at the front end of project development enhances and streamlines the systems integration process later on. This changing context and these changing methods also make us have to revisit how we deliver projects for clients. How does mapping systems processes relate to project development and delivery? Typically, when we design and build industrial facilities, we, the designers, the owner's representatives, and the operators, assume that we are experts and that we know what the project has to be and how it has to function. 
but often assuming that the designers and owners and operators know what the facility and its systems have to be and how they have to function is a faulty assumption. Typically, an owner may have built their last facility 10 or 15 years ago or more. And in this new facility that they're designing, that we're designing for them, the owner is implementing new workflows, new processes with new equipment and with new staff. Therefore, during design development, we realize that we don't actually know as much as we think we do about how the system should operate and how it should be designed. Too many factors have changed since the last Develop, uh, since we last developed a facility of this type, a system of this type, even if only a few years have passed. Per the diagram on the left, we typically start out with a concept based on historical precedent, and it seems valid at first. But as we get into detailed design, we realize all of the ways that adding new equipment and software and workflows changes what is needed in the system that we're designing. So then we go through a change management process to fix the flaws and address the gaps between detailed design and construction. This leads to finger pointing. Why was this missed or that missed? Why didn't you tell us about this or that? And all the while, the costs are escalating, schedules are getting pushed out, creates a lot of stress for the team, for the client, it creates a lot of risk. Conversely, per the diagram on the right, with the more rigorous requirements development process at the start of the project, we discover the flaws in our design at project inception by forcing the requirements to be mapped and stabilized at project start instead of later in design and construction when it is more difficult and costly to do so. We also need to enhance how we manage the design construction and validation processes to take into account the much larger role that systems and software development plays in extensively automated facilities. The diagram on the screen shows that the best practice project delivery model in human factors and systems engineering, called the V model of systems and software development, maps cleanly and directly onto the integrated project delivery model of project development, which is the current best practice in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. This means that incorporating best practice workflows from human factors and systems engineering into the architecture, engineering, and construction best practice workflows is easy and entirely doable. It's a natural fit. It also means that incorporating proper requirements engineering to support the design of integrated software platforms fits well within facility design workflows. This is important. We can develop automation software integration in parallel with facilities development without requiring fundamentally new project delivery models. This is wonderful news. By incorporating human factors workflows into the front end of project development, we are acknowledging upfront that our understanding of the needs and wants of the owner's representatives, their goals, their use cases, and ultimately their requirements are fuzzier than we at first realized. But if we put stakeholders input through a set of logical filters, we can clean them up and validate them to a point where we can move forward into design with a validated, trustworthy set of requirements, goals, use cases, and so on, greatly simplifying the system development process. This is a high level overview of proper requirements of a proper requirements definition process. First, we identify owner needs. From those needs, we extract goals, that is, what the owner intends to do, measures, that is, how the owner knows if their systems and processes meet their goals, use cases, that is, what the owner does to achieve the goals, scenarios, et cetera, all the way down to requirements. Using the process tends to clarify scope, often reducing scope, and therefore also reducing cost schedule and risk for all parties. It is also a natural good fit uh, for not only facility design, but also for establishing validated requirements for the development of systems automation and AI enhancements to the systems. That is, the information will be immediately useful for accelerating and harmonizing the systems development work of the equipment vendors, control systems engineers, and the quality and commissioning protocols for quality and commissioning teams. These are two case studies that I like to reference. Per the case study on the left, just by using a rigorous requirements development and validation method at the start of a large multi-billion dollar project, the Army saved over $200 million on the project. And keep in mind, if you look at the reference below, this is about 25 years old, that money is much greater in today's dollars. So it was on the order of about 10% at the time. 
For the uh, case study on the right, a large children's hospital realized savings of many tens of millions of dollars by using a rigorous requirements development and validation method at the start of a new project for a large children's hospital. And again, the savings, I think in that case, they had stated were on the order of 5%. This here is an article about Google's optimization of the energy performance of some of their data centers. Even though they heavily leaned on AI and deep learning to optimize the energy performance of data centers, and they did achieve 40% energy use reduction to cool the facilities, it required having knowledgeable, capable human subject matter experts. The, the humans had to train the system, manage the system, and choose what recommendations from the system to accept or reject. Most AI-enhanced processes run this way. This is known as a human-in-the-loop process. Moreover, the humans are needed on an ongoing basis because each project is different and each facility changes in different ways over time. Requirements development and validation and the curation of the content that AI analyzes and the resultant outputs are ongoing, evolving, full-time jobs for people. It is important to understand some fundamentals of the technology underlying AI-enabled automation, and especially to understand some of its limitations. Most of the algorithms that make up what we call machine learning or artificial intelligence are flows of information through sets of rule-based processes that optimize based on a set of stated goals. For instance, minimize the time or maximize precision. Most of these algorithms have been around for a very long time, on the order of 50 to 80 years or more. Historically, these algorithms were used in manual analyses or required substantial computing power and time to automate computing power and time that most people and organizations could not afford. It is only in the past 10 or 20 years that the computing power to automate use of these tools for large data analysis has been possible for commercial industry. For the example shown, neural network algorithms are important components in AI-enhanced automation. They are based on models of how neurons and synapses and biological agents work to create cognition. The algorithms process a set of inputs through a set of rule-based filters. The process repeats each time adjusting the weighting rules and weighted values of the outputs from each layer, honing in on a target output goal. This is a way to optimize a system but you would not want to run a system this way because it's really resource intensive for little to no benefit. Typically, once the artificial intelligence or machine learning system figures out the optimal process configuration, it is more efficient to codify what the algorithms learn in traditional linear equations and to run the system with the traditional linear equations. The AI or ML, that is artificial intelligence or machine learning, may still be used during operations but their roles are different in operations. They are used to monitor the systems in case its operation falls out of specification based on the linear equations being used to run the processes. But limiting the use of AI is about more than just energy and time efficiency. Once a design specification is developed for systems performance, and once a system meets those requirements, we do not want the system to evolve or change in unpredictable ways. For instance, if an AI that drives vehicles has the freedom to continuously evolve, it could evolve in a way that means it, no longer, it is no longer operating within the specification required by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. From an operations perspective and a regulatory perspective, this is an un unacceptable risk. What if an AI-enabled autonomous tractor trailer decided that it had an ethical or business obligation that led it to violate its own driving specifications? Is it free to choose to not carry a cargo of weapons or chemicals because they are at odds with its company's corporate social responsibility policy? Could it decide that protecting its driver justifies putting other vehicles or drivers or pedestrians at risk? Similarly, in a shipping warehouse for medicines, would it be acceptable for an AI-enhanced automated storage and retrieval system to prioritize processing orders for the most profitable drugs over processing orders for less profitable drugs. Given the, the above examples, while AI will have a direct and less constrained role in human-directed systems optimization during design, its role in directly managing mission-critical systems operations in real time will be highly constrained, and this will, in fact, complicate the maximization of realizing its potential operational benefits. 
In addition, the evolution from relational databases to graph-based databases is complementary to the proliferation of AI-enhanced workflows. There's a natural over overlap in the graph-theoretic data structures of graph-based databases uh, with the way that artificial neural networks process information. Another set of key concerns includes complicatedness, complexity, interaction effects, and nonlinear relationships. A problem in data and analysis is that if we use the wrong model or algorithm to analyze a data set, we will get a result even if it is not even if it is not useful, even if it is wrong. For instance, Analyzing a nonlinear relationship with a linear regression model will yield a linear effect, even if it is not a good fit. Properly optimizing models and analyses is a process in and of itself, and it takes time. Until models and analyses are validated, the value of the results is unknown and can in fact be misleading or wrong. Regarding interaction effects, once the algorithms are, an are analyzing a whole bunch of variables interacting all at once, Surprising unpredicted results can occur based upon the interaction effects. Complexity science has methods for modeling how all of the little rounding errors and little assumptions and little ways we fudge things to make them work can aggregate until a major unexpected shift in model structure or behavior occurs, which is sometimes called an emergent behavior. Often these emergent behaviors are not predictable. This is problematic for businesses and regulatory agencies. On this topic of the limits of prediction, here is a great example from a physics book. Let's read this together. The problem is that to correctly compute the ninth impact, you need to take into account the gravitational pull of somebody standing next to the table. And to compute the 56th impact, every single elementary particle in the universe needs to be present in your assumptions. If it is this difficult to calculate a pool ball moving around a pool table, then clearly there are limits on the accuracy of modeling and predicting industrial operations. There are methods to assess systems behavior that cannot be predicted with equation-based predictive analytics. For example, Bayesian analysis and agent-based modeling are two methods that can be used for predicting systems behavior that cannot be predicted with traditional analytics. As this research paper on parsimony and self-consistency in intelligent systems explains, developing intelligent systems, including AI-enhanced systems and automation, is a much more tractable challenge if we simplify and validate information to the greatest extent possible. Practically speaking, it is best to develop accurate, low-dimensional representations of high-dimensional reality for use with AI-enhanced and automation-enhanced systems. For example, if we want to calculate the area of a room, it is more resource efficient to represent the room as a low dimensional rectangle and calculate length and width, length times width, than to use a high dimensional representation like a 3D model or photograph to figure out the area. This brings us back to our HSE topic. These classic simplicity principles are in alignment with the key points of the parsimony and self-consistency paper on developing intelligent systems. These classic simplicity principles are also in alignment with sound requirements development and validation. Why are these paradigm shifts in how we assess complex systems relevant? Let's go back to where we started. We started by talking about how and why we may not understand the facilities that we design and operate as well as we think that we do. And now we have covered why and how AI-enhanced and automation-enhanced processes can provide optimizations to industrial operations, but are limited in use for a variety of reasons, including energy and time to sample and process information, goodness of fit of models, model validation, and the limits of predictive analytics. We have to look at project requirements with fresh eyes to validate that we understand what the system is and how it functions in a particular place with a particular set of technologies at a specific point in time toward a specific set of goals and for a specific set of stakeholders. Now we've touched upon the limits of predictive modeling. Let's think about this in the context of digital twins. We can model what exists and maintain a high fidelity digital twin model of what exists. 
But as far as predicting performance based on that digital twin, both due to the practical limitations of predicting future states based on current models and due to risk management concerns, the algorithms work in limited, constrained ways. To this point, in the article referenced earlier about Google using AI to optimize energy performance in its data centers, Google acknowledged that the AI will likely not have worked as quickly for the uh, optimization of other facility types. Data centers are highly constrained in their operations, and Google has a wealth of granular knowledge about its own systems that it could use to train the AI. Conversely, this is typically not the case in most facilities. Most facilities have more varied and or complex workflows without as much granular data about them. Given the substantial benefits of AI and automation, but also the constraints and limitations for use, a critical question for designers and owners is how to determine when to trust and when not to trust AI-enhanced and automation-enhanced operations. In human factors, the methods associated with determining the trustworthiness of AI-enhanced and automation-enhanced systems is called calibrated trust. For each AI-enhanced system and or automated system, we should establish formal constraints to tell us when to trust it and to what degree. Assessing human use of AI-enhanced systems and automation more broadly is typically referred to as human-machine teaming or human-AI robot teaming or neuroergonomics or human systems integration in the field of human factors. These processes contribute to more rigorous requirements development and validation. On the screen is shown one particular human-machine teaming assessment framework. There are many other wonderful requirements development methods that can be used. Some are more rigorous, some are quick and easy. All can be applied to information provided by the stakeholders to figure out where there's natural alignment and stakeholder input, where there's misalignments, and to start to figure out what information we can trust and to what degree. So when is it appropriate to do this level of enhanced analysis as part of rigorous requirements development? When all stakeholders give different stories about processes, operations, and organization, when there is too much variability in their responses to questions, when it is difficult to know what information is true, when few requirements exhibit strong consensus, in all of these cases, more rigorous requirements development processes at project inception may help to uncover, stabilize, and streamline project scope development, schedule development, budget development, and to accelerate the development of AI enhancements and automation at the start of the project. Let's return to the Google Data Center example. Yes, AI did the optimization. Yes, AI reduced the use of energy by 40%, but it was only because there were humans curating what went into the AI, observing its analysis, tweaking its analytic methods, and figuring out what information was trustworthy and useful. And so in our roles as consultants, as engineers, as architects, and as owners and operators, the real value we bring is helping curate the information going into our models and simulations so that those models and simulations can be used productively. And also in assessing the outputs of those models and simulations and determining what outputs to trust and to what degree. Typically, we talk about humans in the loop if we participate integrally on an ongoing basis in the AI-enhanced and or automation-enhanced processes. Conversely, we talk about humans on the loop if humans perform a monitoring role over AI and automation but are not continuously involved in the information processing. In closing, I'll leave you with three thoughts. First, anything you do to map, clarify, reduce, prioritize, or validate the scope during project planning or conceptual design is time well spent and value added, both to facilities development in general and also specifically for the development of AI and automation enhancements to work processes. Second, integrated project delivery, or IPD, and building information modeling, or BIM, have had substantial and positive impacts on project execution in the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. The McLeamy curve, shown on the left, 
shows the benefits of using IPD and BIM over traditional design bid build project delivery to improve management of cost and scope by pulling forward the uncovering of scope issues to the basic design and detailed design phases. But third, per the revised curve on the right, using more rigorous requirements development methods in the project planning and conceptual design phases will typically reduce the overall number of requirements and therefore scope, cost, and schedule because time is not spent designing and or building things that are not needed. Adding more rigorous requirements development and validation is also a natural good fit for establishing validated requirements for the development of systems automation and AI enhancements. The validated requirements will be immediately useful for accelerating and harmonizing the systems development work of the equipment vendors, the control systems engineers, and the quality and the protocols for quality and commissioning teams. Thank you for attending this presentation. I'll turn it back over to Dave. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, thanks also to Erica and Alex. And Joe, that presentation I think was excellent and you know very relevant to the work that we are currently doing and the work that we see forthcoming into the future. So now we're gonna take a moment uh, to address a few questions that we've received from the audience. And for the audience on the call, a reminder to please make use of the Q&A tab to ask any questions, which should be addressed to all panelists. So the first question here, Joe, that I've uh, received from the audience is as follows. Uh, how have advancements in technology influenced the evolution of human factors in industrial automation over the past few decades? Any thoughts on that? I think the single biggest need that has developed and to which human factors and systems engineering have responded is it's become increasingly difficult to trust what information is valid and what information is not, and also to trust what recommendations from the system are valid and what recommendations are not. And that's why we really see the proliferation of new, the, the focus of research and also the pro proliferation of new methods and tools focused on these questions of how do we know what to trust and then what do we do with that information? Sure, there was a, a second part to that question um, and it is related to examples, wondering if you might have an example in mind on how these advancements have been uh, integrated in some of the modern practices that we currently see. Any thoughts on that? I'll, I'll give you several. One is that for most what are, we call automated systems, there's an, a very large team of humans behind the automation to make it work on an ongoing basis. Examples I can share from either conferences I've been to or you know panels I've been on, presentations I've given with others, um, Typically, for a, like an unmanned aerial vehicle, it can take as many as 40 to 50 people to keep it in the air. Um, a lot of times for unmanned aerial um, missile systems and other systems of that nature, it can take dozens to hundreds of people to manage the system and keep it operating in a you know, quote-unquote automated way. In the case of, um, as I mentioned, the, the examples I mentioned, um, not only in healthcare, but in uh, Department of Defense, it's typical to use um, very rigorous requirements development at the front end, including mock-ups and simulations, high fidelity ones like cardboard city mock-up type. I know the VA does it. Again, the Atlanta Children's Hospital did it. Other hospitals do that, as well as uh, DOD and the various branches of the military. And it's gradually finding its way into large commercial industry. All right, that's great. Thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts on that with us, Joe. Uh, another question that's come in here, I think, is quite interesting. What are some of the key challenges faced by human factors professionals today, specifically that were not present in the early stages of the field? Any thoughts on that, Joe, please? One of the key challenges is as you look at the more advanced requirements validation measure, methods that, are, that, are, that have evolved in the past 10 or 20 years, they are primarily subjective. It's very hard to develop objective requirements validation methods when you're looking at things like situation awareness and human machine teaming. 
Now, while this is a challenge for humans, it's especially a problem if you wanted to try to build that into an AI system, because how do you automate what is fundamentally a subjective method of analysis? analysis? It's harder to do. And the results, just like with humans, are going to be more varied. So I think the, I would say, uh, an obstacle, if you will, to the next evolution of AI enhanced systems is first these methods and measures in, in human factors and systems engineering are being developed in general. But then the question of how to automate what are fundamentally subjective assessments is itself a, 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 a quite substantial technical challenge. All right, excellent. Um, just a few more questions we received here, Joe. The next one uh, talks about, quote unquote, bridging the gap. And uh, it's asking, how can industries effectively bridge the gap between traditional requirements and more rigorous requirements to ensure better outcomes in AI and automation projects? Any thoughts on that for the audience on the line? Well, I, I would go back to, again, a, a, a benefit is um, that, and I think it was slide 25, the V model compared to IPD. I guess the benefit for our industry, for people developing large capital projects, is that it just so happens that the best process, the best practice software and systems development uh, project delivery model maps very cleanly onto, onto how we design um, and construct um, and commission buildings and, and facilities. So as far as bridging the gap, I think what you see, and you, you can see there's an especially large arrow on the upper left side. And what that's indicating is that for the most part, the IPD process, which is represented by the blue arrows, mirrors precisely the V model of project and systems development. The missing piece, if you will, is that big blue big blue arrow in the IPD process. The missing piece is the rigorous requirements development up front. But um, because the two models align so closely overall, it's, a, it's an important step, but a relatively straightforward step to incorporate more rigorous requirements development. As far as how far you take that, one of the things I mentioned is that uh, in one of the slides is some of the methods are very quick and easy. Some of them are really rigorous. The question becomes, when do you need something like scientific level of rigor in your assessment versus when is something that's quick and dirty good enough? And there are some methods in particular that are wonderful in part because they can be done in a quick and dirty way, which yields a lot of benefits immediately for very little input or very little time expended or money expended. But they can also be uh, reconfigured to deliver something like scientific um, or scientific rigor. A good example is the Delphi method, which um, you can message me about if you want to know more about it, but it can be done either in a quick and dirty way or in a way where you have um, statistically valid results. All right. Very well. Thank you, Joe, for answering that. Um, just one other question here I'll pose to you. I know you talked a little bit about social and organizational dynamics, and I think that's the basis of the question at hand here. The question is this. What are some practical strategies for integrating social and organizational dynamics into the development of AI systems? Whoever asked that question, you can always message us separately and I can respond in more length. But in general, there's a subject I didn't touch upon, which is called sociotechnical systems. And starting around World War II, there was an understanding that for some complex technical systems, that have a high degree of social organizational component to them, you cannot actually fully engineer them up front. The only way to develop them is to put what they would call like a seed or an armature in place and start using it and effectively develop it on the fly. So you could think of it like an agile method, but basically if there's a large social component to how processes are run, and I would extend social to beyond just human to human, it's human to human, human to machine, but also machine to machine. If there's a large social component, effectively what you have to do is put the pieces together in some basic configuration, like a minimum viable product, and just start using them in operations. And then allow yourself a period of time, like a commissioning period, to develop and integrate the systems to the point where they function as you require. But uh, it starts with acknowledging up front that for systems with with large degrees of social components to 
uh, inherent in their functioning that you will never be able to fully engineer them up front and then just specify a design. You'll always have to basically cultivate them. All right. Excellent, Joe. Thank you very much. You know, I see we are getting close to the top of the hour, and those are all the questions um, for our webinar today. I want to again thank you, Joe, Eric, and Alex, for a um, very informative webinar, and also for the time that you have spent both today with us and in preparation for the delivery. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our audience for attending today. It's certainly been a pleasure being your moderator. Please continue to stay informed of these events by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or following our social media channels using hashtag Innovation Builders. If you'd like us to send you email notifications of future webinars, please email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in today. We'll send out a compiled list of the Q&A shortly, along with the notification that the webinar recording is available for replay on floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. From all of us at the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.